Hi everyone, my name is Dave and welcome to Extra Credit, a video series where we take an unscripted look at topics relating to local history and exploring that history. All right, so this episode is all about the PD Railway. Now, before we get to that, I just want to take a moment to let everybody know to please visit my website. There is a link to the website at the end of the video. There's also a link in the description that you can take a look at. As well, you can follow me on social media. So I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram. Uh, as well, please make sure that you click that subscribe button and that way you'll get all of the latest updates before anybody else. Uh, and so you'll keep up to date on what is going on. So, uh, as I just said, this episode is all about the PD Railway, um, as it's commonly known as, but its full name is the Port Arthur Duluth and Western Railway. And so, as if you saw my first episode, uh, where I talked a little bit about how I got into doing all of this, uh, you'll know that the PD Railway was uh, the catalyst uh, the thing that that essentially um, got me into doing all of this this type of history. So it is something that is very, very close to me, something that I've spent a lot of time researching and something that I'm very, very familiar with. So basically what we're going to do in this episode, so this is kind of the first of a bunch of different episodes that we're going to be doing on the PD. So obviously you guessed that in the, in the title where it says the PD part one. Um, so this is going to be basically kind of like a little bit of a, a synopsis of kind of the history of the railway line. Uh, and then what we'll do in subsequent episodes is we'll get into specific topics related to it. We'll talk about little places where you can kind of go and see and visit some of the history related to the, uh, to the railway line. So the, the, the history of the PD Railway uh, dates back many, many years, uh, going back into the uh, latter part of the 1800s. So um, basically, this all kind of started uh, when the first railway line was built across Canada, the Canadian Pacific, um, you know, uh, wasn't really called that until 1881. But parts of the construction of this first transcontinental railway uh, began in 1875. Now, when construction happened uh, in my hometown uh, and, and where I live in Thunder Bay uh, at the time was two separate cities for, for a long time, Fort William, Port Arthur. But even before that, um, you know, basically it was even more kind of just uh, not disorganized, unorganized. Uh, you basically had Port Arthur, which was Prince Arthur's Landing. Uh, and then, you know, Fort William, there was kind of this loose name uh, the, 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 the the town hasn't been incorporated yet. So basically what happened was when when the uh, the construction began on the Canadian Pacific, in 1875, uh, they decided that kind of the terminus of the railway as they were building to the west was going to be the, the south side of what is now Thunder Bay. So basically Fort William uh, and more specifically uh, a part where I actually grew up in called West Fort, okay, West Fort William. And uh, obviously the, the citizens that lived in the northern part of Thunder Bay, what is now Thunder Bay, Prince Arthur's Landing were obviously very unhappy about this because they had felt that they had they'd been sort of left out uh, of all of this. And so um, they they uh, they wanted to initially kind of link in with this railway. So they did build uh, a little little railway line uh, to join the Canadian Pacific Line known as the, uh, the Prince Arthur's Landing and Kaministiqua Railway. But that wasn't sort of good enough for them. Uh, they wanted to kind of build something that would kind of uh, you know, get them kind of uh, out of the clutches of the of the Canadian Pacific Railway. So around the time that the Canadian Pacific was incorporated as a company in 1881, the um, citizens of Port Arthur, some of the leading citizens of Port Arthur and some outside investors tried to incorporate a, uh, a railway line to build uh, southward into uh, to Minnesota and it was called the Thunder Bay uh, in Minnesota Railway. And uh, so they petitioned uh, the federal parliament for a, a charter to build this railway line. Now, unfortunately, uh, because of some issues revolving around the agreement that had been signed with the Canadian Pacific Railway, the uh, the charter was basically disallowed. Um, uh, essentially, the uh, the Canadian Pacific had an anti competition clause that um, you know said that they were not allowed to uh, that nobody was allowed to build a railway line south. Uh, of the Canadian Pacific Line, specifically kind of trying to avoid l railway lines building into the United States. And obviously it was a problem here. There were uh, some some issues that were popping up in Manitoba because people had sort of the same thought as well um, in, in that province. Um, and so basically that, that application for that charter was thrown out of parliament and the people that were behind that decided to take their, their petition to the provincial government. So at the time you could also get a railway charter from the provincial government. So the 
people that were kind of behind this were sort of some of the leading citizens of the city. So people like Thomas Marx, who would go on to become the first mayor of the city of Port Arthur. Uh, you had um, some really interesting characters. You had people like E.A. Wild, uh, Edward Augustus Wild, who was a, uh, a former American Civil War officer. Um, very, very colorful um, sort of past behind him. Uh, there's actually a book uh, out there on EA Wild if you're if you're interested in in kind of reading it. Um, so anyway, so they petitioned the provincial government, and so in 1883 they were given a charter for the Thunder Bay Colonization Railway, and so this railway was 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 going to build sort of southwest from from Thunder Bay from Port Arthur, uh, and then kind of turn more westerly towards the, uh, the the Fort Francis Rainy River area. At that time, the population was growing. There was a lot of uh, big mineral discoveries that were that were kind of happening there, and so they want to kind of. To, to tie into that. So they did get their charter. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, there was most likely financial issues that kind of hindered the, uh, the construction of this line. And so it kind of spun around for a few years, nothing kind of got really started. And then four years later in 1887, um, they decided to change the name of the railway line. Um, and uh, they finally did get a, a federal charter as well. So uh, the name was changed to what it eventually became, which was the Port Arthur Duluth and Western Railway. Um, and they did get that federal charter and, and the route changed as well. And this was kind of a little bit of a reflection of the fact that there was some, some, some changes in, in kind of what they were trying to do. And so now the railway was gonna head Southwest from Port Arthur, but uh, was going to cross the, the, the boundary into Minnesota. But um, now there was all of a sudden this talk of, of building to Gunflit Lake and it, and it had to do with, with iron mining. So one of the original reasons for building this railway line was to access a uh, number of silver mines that were being opened up southwest of Thunder Bay. But um, now sort of the emphasis had been turned to, to iron mining. And, and there's a whole sort of story behind that. And, and there's a big part of the story that we don't quite know yet and don't quite understand because, uh, and we probably will never know because we don't know some of the inner workings and some of the inner details of how that all kind of how that all kind of played out. So um, in the fall of 1887, there actually was an aborted uh, bit of construction that was done. There was nine miles of railway line that was um, that was cleared and graded all the way from Port Arthur just to the to the western side of the Nebing River. And uh, unfortunately, uh, after that, construction stopped and everything was kind of abandoned. And again, uh, a lot of that had to do with probably financial issues, financial reasons. Um, and so then kind of uh, th there was uh, there was a lot of political things that were going on. Some of the the the, the new people that were involved in the railway project, people like Wilde had kind of moved on. Uh, so Marx was still involved. Uh, another name that pops up is a guy by the name of Daniel Francis Burke, who was another leading citizen of Port Arthur. Um, again, some politics involved. Marx was a conservative. Um, Burke was a liberal, right? And so there was probably some political infighting in there. In the meantime, uh, a sort of rival slash complementary railway venture had been had been um, chartered as well, okay, called the Ontario Rainy River. Uh, and that railway line was supposed to build from Port Arthur to the Rainy River District and then eventually on to Manitoba to provide an alternate route to the Canadian Pacific uh, to the west. Um, and so a, a year later, um, there were some some financial subsidies that came from the from the federal government. And then so finally, in the fall of 1889, uh, construction got started again. Uh, basically, they abandoned that 1887 route. They were going to take a different route now. They're they basically going to eventually kind of uh, follow the route of the old Prince Arthur's Landing and Kaministiqua Railway through from Port Arthur through Fort William uh, and then to the west, basically hugging the North Shore, uh, the North Bank of the Kaministiqua River to Stanley and then turning southwest from there. So. Uh, construction proceeds fairly quickly, uh, really up until around Christmas time to around the time that they're they're constructing the bridge over the Kaministiqua River. Now, unfortunately, everything kind of comes to a, a screeching halt um, uh, after that. And and again, uh, we we basically can believe that that was financially driven. That um, you know the, the company was starting to run out of funds to to continue the construction. So um, this is where kind of the tide of the railway begins to turn and uh, its fate kind of, uh, um, you know, is, is, is forever changed. And so what ends up happening is all of a sudden we start to see some new names uh, being associated with the, uh, with the railway line. Um, 
uh, and, and these names are some very prominent individuals from the city of Toronto. So first we start seeing uh, people like um, Hugh Blaine uh, and um, a guy by the name of Eby, okay? And they are in business together, uh, Eby Blaine and Company. They're a grocery wholesaler in, in, in Toronto. Later on, they're joined by a couple of other guys, um, Arthur B. Lee, okay, and John Lees, and they are co-owners of a hardware retailer, okay, uh, called Bryce Lewis and & Son. And so basically they bring this big, huge infusion of capital. Um, I'm sure there's other investors as well. Um, there's, um, you know, all of a sudden these bank loans start appearing from the, uh, the Canadian Bank of Commerce. And so construction just gets underway. Now, what's interesting about this is the, the, the construction, the man that's in charge of, of the, uh, the, the project, the contractor. Um, it, it's essentially a partnership, but for the most part, uh, there's one individual that kind of controls that, and that's James Conmey. And so James Conmey uh, had previously built sections of the Canadian Pacific Railway, but now he's in charge of building the, uh, the PD Railway. Now, and what's interesting about it is James Conmey is also the um, provincial representative uh, for this for this area. And so in today's day, day and age, this would be a huge conflict of interest where you have somebody who is a local politician who is now controlling the construction of this railway line that certainly is going to benefit the area and certainly pad his uh, uh, his political acumen. So, you uh, I mean, certainly when we think about today and we think about some of the, the political things that go on, uh, they were happening back then as well. Uh, so essentially, the uh, the construction resumes and uh, eventually, there, there is a lot of challenges that, that go through that. And you can see that in some of my videos. You can see some of the places that, that I do visit. And, and particularly as you get close to the, 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 the border areas with Minnesota, places like North Lake and Gunflint Lake, there was a lot of very difficult construction that went on. So basically, by the end of 1892, construction has been completed through to the end of Gunflint Lake. Um, the Canadian terminus at Gunflint Lake, and then an additional six miles have been built into the state of Minnesota uh, to the Paulson Iron Mine, and that's a whole nother story in and itself. Um, basically, this was where the uh, the mine, uh, sorry, the railway wanted to get to was this mine uh, to obviously access the iron and then haul that iron. And then the goal was is that once that was done, they were going to use the revenue from the Paulson Mine to eventually complete the railway line an additional 40 miles through to the uh, to the town of Ely, Minnesota, and and link up with uh, another railway line that was uh, that had reached Ely, which was the uh, Duluth and Iron Range Railroad. Um, and so uh, now, unfortunately, when just as the railway is being completed. Uh, and open for traffic, um, catastrophe strikes. And so what ends up happening is the world goes into a depression. And this depression is actually known as the Panic of 1893. And um, essentially, it's devastating to the uh, to the PD. Basically, the, uh, the, the Paulson mine has been kind of built on some very shaky financing. And again, there's a whole story and a whole background to all of that. And you can see that in a presentation uh, if you're interested. Um, and you'll see the link up on the screen. And so that all kind of collapses. And so now the PD is basically just you know, um, you know, the, its main source of revenue is taken away from it. So now you have this railway line that's been built 85 miles uh, plus to the middle of nowhere, to nothing. Uh, so there is no major source of revenue at this time. All the silver mines closed down. And so really the only thing that's going to keep the, the PD going for the next foreseeable future, unless the mine opens up, is logging. Um, but there's no, there's no connection. There is no, it's the railway, you know, it's been described in a book one time, the railway to nowhere. Um, and, and really that is the, the essence of this line. And so it kind of staggers on for a bunch of years and just complete continues to hemorrhage and, uh, and bleed money uh, until eventually, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Toronto backers, the, the group that I call the syndicate, they eventually take complete control of the line, right? So all of the, you know, the local people are pushed out and, and essentially the line is being um, run by all of these Toronto backers. They eventually take control of the line and they began shopping around for a buyer. And um, it, it's a bit of a tumultuous kind of process, but eventually the line is built, uh, is bought by uh, a, a gentleman by the no name of William McKenzie and his build business partner, Donald Mann. And if those names are familiar, um, uh, it's because McKenzie and Mann later on go on to um, create Canadian Northern Railway. And so the, uh, the PD becomes part of the Canadian Northern uh, system. 
And um, one of the first things that Canadian Northern does is they 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 build the uh, the Ontario and Rainy River. They basically build the link from Port Arthur to, to through to Winnipeg, and the PD is actually part of that, and that's the reason why they actually buy the PD. Uh, but then they don't really know what else to do with this, right? They, they kind of do want to complete it, but they do have some other projects. Basically, Canadian Northern eventually decides that they want to build kind of a, a transcontinental uh, railway system uh, to compete with the Canadian Pacific and then as well the the Grand Trunk and the, the National Transcontinental System. Uh, and so their attention is kind of diverted elsewhere. So it's really kind of after the turn of the century. So the PD is bought by Mackenzie and Mann in 1899. And after this time, kind of the PD kind of really blossoms uh, and, and kind of grows. Um, and so eventually what ends up happening is uh, there's a lot of upgrades that are done. There's a kind of a bit of a boom in business, uh, primarily um, as a result of the Pigeon River Lumber Company and their logging operation at Gunflint Lake. Again, there's another presentation that you can take a look at. And so there'll be a little link up on the screen that you can uh, that you can follow. Um, and so um, uh, eventually, the, I mean, the railway does kind of come into its own. There's, there's a lot of new settlers that are kind of moving into areas along the railway line, particularly along the Whitefish River Valley. Uh, so we start to see places like, um, you know, Hearthstone and, and Flint. Heimers, Nolulu, um, you know, so it's kind of serving these populations, but but really, and, and unless a link gets built, um, it's just going to be kind of this sort of forgotten branch line. Uh, eventually, the Canadian Northern system itself goes bankrupt, and so in 1918, um, the uh, the PD, uh, which has been known uh, either as the the Duluth extension of the Canadian Northern, and then subsequently the North Lake. Um, branch of the Canadian Northern Railway is taken over by um, is taken over by Canadian National. So um, Canadian Northern um, is nationalized uh, under the uh, the moniker Canadian National, along with some other uh, bankrupt lines. Um, um, pieces of the PD have been abandoned already. So the stretch between Gunflint and North Lake has been abandoned. And shortly after Canadian Northern, uh, sorry, Canadian National takes over, they abandon another stretch. So uh, essentially there is really no business um, kind of in the North Lake area. And so in 1923, they stopped running trains uh, from Mackey's to North Lake. And so basically the, the PD is now down to about 47 miles of track. And so it kind of continues on for the next 15 years. Uh, again, not really kind of generating a ton of revenue, um, having all kinds of uh, having all kinds of issues with its infrastructure because, you know, um, companies, uh, you know, Canadian Northern really doesn't want to our Canadian National doesn't really want to pump a lot of money into it. Uh, and so eventually what ends up happening is in 1938, uh, in the spring of 1938, um, basically CN actually has to stop operating the railway line. There's numerous bridges along the line, particularly in the Hymers area, that have found to be to be structurally deficient and that require upgrades. And, and, and after looking at the books, CN uh, essentially decides that uh, this line isn't worth running anymore. Um, it's not generating any revenue. There's too much competition now from things like buses and trucks. And so they eventually decide, they, they put an application in with the Canadian government to abandon the line. And in October of 1938, that application is accepted. And so the, the line is formally abandoned. And over the next years, the, uh, the whatever remains of the rails are, are ripped up. Uh, and basically uh, sold for scrap uh, and wherever their their disposition ends up. And so basically that sort of ends the history of the of the PD railway. I um, mean, some of the legacies still kick around. Obviously, you know, in the years afterwards, people would still use the, the grade um, to kind of move around. Some of the, so a couple of the stations were still standing for a number of years. Um, the station at North Lake, which stood uh, until the 1970s, was around. The Silver Mountain Station, which still is standing today, is still there. The uh, the bridge that the uh, that the railway used to cross the Kaministiquia River. Um, just north of Stanley is still there, uh, and that bridge was rebuilt in 1922. So there was there was a huge part of the uh, of the legacy that that still stuck around, and so hopefully this is kind of a a good little introduction to you to kind of uh, the history of the line and kind of how it sort of played out over the years. And so what we're going to do in subsequent sort of sub 
episodes uh, of this series, so part two and three and so on, uh, is we're going to start taking a look at some of the sort of the smaller little details, some of the some of the the, uh, the little nuances in terms of its history, and then also take a look at some of the areas where some of the history is still alive. I did mention some of those places, so places like um, Stanley, where the bridge is still standing, Silver Mountain. Uh, where the last remaining station still stands and, and a few other places where you could you can actually go out and, and see some of that history and kind of maybe explore a little bit of it on your own. So thanks for tuning in, everyone. Um, again, make sure that you uh, you check out my website and follow me on social media. And uh, we will we'll be back uh, as soon as we can with uh, a latest episode. Uh, and that'll be coming up next month. So again, our episodes are kind of spaced out every month for this extra credit series. So thanks for tuning in and take care, everyone.